morning. Um, are you seated beside someone who is good looking? Yes. yes. Can you encourage the person right next to you? Okay. We're so glad that you can make it here today. So glad that you can make it here for 11 a.m. service. And um, before I proceed with the Word of God today, I'd like to take this time to honor our volunteers. Do you appreciate the volunteers? Yes. We appreciate our ushering ministry, our worship team, our Advent support team, our technical and stage management team. We have Kids Church volunteers. You know, the reason why we have services like this, and I don't know if you appreciate the kind of service that we have, um, the level of excellence that um, they give here, and the reason why we experience these kind of things is because of the volunteers. We won't have an orderly and excellent service apart from them. And so I do hope that whenever you have time, please do ap approach them and appreciate them. And if you also want to volunteer, if you want to be part of any of our volunteer ministries, just please let us know, approach any of our volunteers so that they can connect you to be one. And you know what? We don't like uh, disorderly services, right? We like it when um, we say that we're going to start at this time and then we start on that time. And then we say, when we say that we're going to end at this time and when we end at that time, that's a, that's a good service, right? It's an orderly service. Now, every now and then, the Holy Spirit may move us to extend a little bit. But for the most part, we appreciate order. In fact, many of you here perhaps are you know, into um, having order. I mean, you like things when it is order, when it, things are in order. You like things when it's properly arranged. Anyone of you here like that? You are a very organized person. Are you an organized person? Yes. Okay, only a few of you said yes. Okay. My wife, you would ask my wife, she would tell you, um, it depends on what day. <laughs> uh, there are times I admit that, um, you know, uh, there, I, I, there's... A, disorder or I'm not that organized but there are times also that I'd like to be organized because there's something in all of us that want appreciate when things are in order um, some of us were very particular with our houses we want everything to be very clean our desk to be very clean because if your desk is not clean it's hard to focus isn't it it's hard to think when there's a lot of clutter. It's hard to, you know, um, um, give your best when there's a lot, a lot of things are messy. And so that is true for us in our workplaces and even in our homes. But some of us, we're very particular as well with this one, you know, with spelling and the products that we buy. For example, when you get to a department store and you buy something, you know, a shoe like this, uh, under arms, you're wondering, what am I buying here? <laughs> I might, what kind of shoe? Or maybe you um, um, went to a, a bake shop and you saw a, a baked good like this. Okay, so what am I, what are you getting? Are you supposed to get wrinkles after you buy the crinkles? And so, um, meantime, when you go to the restroom and if you see a restroom like this, you would think twice if you would actually go to and um, use that restroom. Some of us may think, well, it's okay, at least my face is covered. <laughs> But it's still hard to use this kind, you know, of uh, if it's not in its proper place, okay, if it's not according to order. You may have encountered signages like this, entrance only, okay, do not enter. So what is it? Okay, is it an entrance? Okay, or are you asking me to exit? Um, one of our pastors encountered this signage um, in one of the road repairs um, somewhere down south, and this is what it says, okay? Road work ahead, please apologize. Okay, so. Not sure what we're trying to communicate. Are we supposed to apologize every time we pass? Okay, sorry, Paul, for breaking the road. Okay, thank you for what you're doing. Okay, so. Something about spelling and grammar that takes, especially for those of us who are into grammar and into spelling, it, parang ano, you can't move on, okay? From uh, things when you see things, uh, when, see, when you see these. And, when you see something in order, you appreciate, kind of like this government service or government office that found a way how to make lines more orderly, okay? So, they would have their shoes, okay, line up. Parang naman walang pila, di ba? So, it's not hassle for those who are waiting. Just leave your shoes, okay? Leave your slippers there and that will be your cue for the line, okay? How many of you, you want this to all our government? How many of you would like Jollibee, okay? When you line up in Jollibee, okay? or in McDonald's, just put your shoes there and it will line up for you. We appreciate order, isn't it? We appreciate being organized. We like it when um, things are working well. And when things are not working well, it places us in 
certain levels of discomfort. We want things to be in order. That is why, you know, when things are not working well at home, when there's a problem in the marriage, a lot of strain, a lot of stress enters into a relationship when that is the case. When um, a family is not in order, when there's fighting at the home, I'm sure um, students who, are, who have parents who are always fighting, you know, they can't focus well in school because, you know, you know the, the environment that they're coming from. And even for those who are working, if your home is not organized, it is hard to go to the office if your home is not um, as it's supposed to be. You're coming from a point or f coming from a, uh, an area, a platform of disorder. And so that's why it's hard to launch forward when that is the case. When we make a lot of bad decisions, we end up in debt. And that, becomes, uh, that happens when we are disorganized with how we handle our money. Now, even as um, peoples and nations, we, we, every now and then we see disorder. And it brings grief into our hearts whenever we see that. Because it's bringing a lot of anxiety and strain and even, you know, hardship to the people when there is disorder. For us as a people, one area that is still not yet in order according to, I believe, how God intended it to be is in the area of poverty. Our nation here in the Philippines, 2.6% of our population, approximately about 21 million Filipinos, still don't get to eat three times a day. Way below the poverty line. And so... What should we do? If we see disorder in our lives, if we see disorder in our homes, if we see disorder in our communities, as Christians, how are we supposed to behave? What should be our response as believers in light of that? Maybe it's us. We don't need to go far and look at our nation and the problems of this nation. But when you look at your home and you see, you know, disorder happening amongst your relationship with your kids and also with your spouse, where do you go? How, where do you turn to? Who do you talk to so that you can bring order in your home? Now, today, as we continue our series foretold, we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 41 to answer these questions that we have had or that we asked today. Please turn your Bibles to Isaiah 42. Isaiah 42, verses 1 all the way to 4. Just four verses for today. If you have your Bibles with you, um, please turn it there. And I'd like everyone to please stand up. As we read the Word of God together. If you have it in your devices, just um, turn on your devices and um, open your Bible apps and put it on Isaiah chapter 42. Isaiah 42 verse 1. It says here, Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint, faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his law. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your words. God, we pray that you would allow us, Lord, to understand it. And not just understand, but also to live this, this word that we're about to read, Lord. Thank you that you desire for our hearts and our eyes to be open to who you are as our Lord and as our King. And I pray, Lord God, that you would help us. Help us as a church, Lord, to exemplify this word today in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. As I mentioned, this is our second week of our series called Foretold. And for those of you who are first time, this is your first time, um, we are in a series um, looking at certain passages in the book of Isaiah to think and to understand who Christ is. Um, we know that four weeks from now, it's going to be the Holy Week, um, Easter Sunday. And what better time for us to think about and ponder about who Jesus Christ is? What's the significance? of his life, his death, and his resurrection to our lives today. And this is a perfect opportunity to do so. And what we're doing is, unlike the previous years wherein we would look at the gospel stories about who Jesus Christ is, we are looking at a prophecy, 
a book that was written 700 years prior to the arrival of Christ, 2,000 years ago. And this from a man called Isaiah. He gave prophetic words or words, you know, from God about what's going to happen in the future. And these words are pertaining to Jesus Christ. And so from this scripture that we have read, um, it is speaking about the kind of uh, the, the authority and the attribute of who Christ is. Before we get there, just a context. Again, um, especially if you were not here, we said last week that the time, the timing when Israel or when um, the prophet Isaiah wrote this was a time of disorder in the land of Israel. Um, they were morally, socially, and nationally disordered at this time. They, are comp they compromised their faith and they compromised their standards of living. And so because of that, God had to um, send foreign nations, two nations, the Assyrians and Babylonians, to conquer Israel and Judah, and for a span of 100 years, brought destruction upon the land and sent their children to exile. And so can you imagine the devastation, the disorder that was happening at that time in the, in the period of Isaiah? And so it was also during this time that God gave this prophetic picture, this prophetic word, just so that the people of Israel might have hope. And us who are 2,700 years after the word was, was, was spoken can also anchor our hope in Christ. Last week, we spoke about Jesus being a wise king, being a righteous king. And so now we're going to look at, um, as the scripture that we've read said, Three times it was mentioned there the word justice. And so as a king, Jesus is a just king. He is a king of justice. I was reminded of uh, a request that was made on air several years ago. There was this woman who called the radio station and said, um, Sir, Mr. DJ, can you play my favorite song on the air? And said, Sure, what is your favorite song? And the song was King Justice. Um, the DJ said, King Justice. I have never heard a song that says King Justice. Can you sing it for me so that I will know what song to play? Oh, that's very simple. She said, dun, 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 King Justice. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Mas mabenta sa 11, ha? <laughs> 9 o'clock, medyo napanis ng konti. So. But thank you for patronizing. <laughs> for those of you who don't understand or you don't know what, what, what I, was, I just said, you know, uh, just Google it. Okay, what's the title of that song? Can't Touch This. Can't Touch This. Okay, King Justice. Don't Google King Justice. Okay, it's Can't Touch This by MC Hammer. Okay, so MC Hammer. Going back to spiritual things, <laughs> justice. Okay. When the prophet Isaiah spoke about this in four verses, three times, emphasizing who Jesus Christ is, who he will be, and who will forever be, he said, this king, this Messiah that will come is a king of justice. When you say justice, we know this because justice is upholding the law. When somebody violates a traffic light, when that, that person gets caught, that is just justice. When somebody does wrong to you and that person pays for what the wrong that he has done to you, that is just justice. It is justice. It's upholding the righteousness of a nation. It's upholding the laws of a land. But yet, when you look at the definition of justice and when you study it further, you will find out that it's deeper than just punishing those that are guilty. In fact, if you would study justice, it is always synonymous or linked towards righteousness. And so with that, um, justice then means to set things right. It's not just punishing. It has a restoring aspect. It's bringing things forth to its original intent. It's to establish things as they ought to be. That's what Isaiah and um, the, the word of justice there, when it's attributed to Christ, these are the definitions and that's how it's supposed to be understood. In other words, Christ came 2,000 years ago to bring order. Christ will come back again. I don't know when, but that will bring ultimate order in all of things. And now as a church, He has commissioned us 
to expand and to extend the order of the kingdom of God in our lives, in our communities, and even to the nations of the world. A lot of leaders have come and gone, and they have promised justice. A lot of leaders have come and gone, and you know, politicians and kings, if you look at history, and they said they're going to bring order, and they brought a certain kind of order through their own means. They brought a certain order through various ways and methodologies. Some of it we regret that they did. Some of it, a lot of people um, experienced bad things through their leadership. But what is the kind of justice that Jesus has given and will give to us? What is the kind of justice that Jesus is about? When we look at this verse, it says in verse 1 of chapter 42, I say, it says there, Behold, my servant whom I uphold. Can you say uphold? My servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. God was saying to Isaiah, the Messiah who is to come, from our vantage point, Jesus came. This Messiah, this Jesus, is someone that God himself would uphold in other words he is god sustained he is god empowered why as we said last week because he is god himself in other words his power is unlimited when you think of justice and think and, and setting things in order how many of you know it takes a lot of power to do that it takes a lot of influence it takes a lot of will but yet this God, this Messiah that was promised, this Jesus has all the power in the world to make things in its proper place as they ought to be. Paul in the New Testament put it this way, and he, meaning Jesus, he is before all things and in him all things hold together. All things hold together together can you imagine everything in our body is still okay because all things are being held together by God can you imagine nature can you imagine the earth if you would expand it a bit can you imagine the solar system can you imagine just the power of God ensuring that Mars will not collide with the earth or Mercury not hitting the earth or Jupiter you know, swallowing up the earth. Can you imagine all things are being held together? These stars, these planets are being held together in its proper place. The Bible says all the heavens are being held in its place because God deems it so. That is the power of our God. Now, here's an interesting thing that we can think. If God has that power to hold all those planets together, to hold all the nations together, even hold our bodies together. Question, what is one area that is in disorder at this time? Can God not keep that in order? Does God not have the power to make things in order in that particular aspect of our lives? God has the power, amen? He has the power to set things in order. And I believe some of us here, maybe it's a physical physical illness that we're believing God to save us from and to heal us. God has the power, amen? Maybe it's a relational disorder that we're experiencing. I, I encourage you, go to Him because there's no other person who has the power to solve that other than Him. We all have limits. Our patience, we have a limited patience. We have a limited, you know, forgiveness. We have a limited um, willpower, but God's power is unlimited, Amen. That is why we can always go to him because he is a just king who is limitless. Second point, it says there, he will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. How will this Jesus bring about justice? He has the power to do so, but as he does, he will not draw attention to himself. He is humble. He is secure. Remember in the passages of the New Testament when you read about stories when Christ would do miracles, right? Remember that? Jesus would make the blind see. Jesus made the, uh, the deaf hear. Um, those who um, possessed with demons, you know, they were set free from demonic oppression. He fed thousands. And 
in many times in the Gospels, he would always tell them, don't tell anyone about the miracle that just happened. Say this to your friends and families, but don't tell anyone else. Because God is not looking for recognition. God is not looking for people to affirm him. Jesus did not look for affirmation from the scholars, from the, those who are well-off and those who are popular because he knows who he is. He's secure with who he is and he just served people humbly. I guess contrary to some of the leaders that we know, contrary to some of the people that we know, right? People would serve and their goal for serving is so that they can be recognized. One of the things that I find amusing, I just, I'm just amazed at it. <laughs> um, initially, I was uh, really pissed off with it, but when you look at waiting sheds, funded by our own taxes, but yet you would see um, um, yeah, through the project of this so-and-so congressman or so-and-so mayor and so-and-so official. And I was wondering, why did they have to put their names? Huh? And pictures. Sometimes you would even see, di ba? Parang, uh, Merry Christmas from this so-and-so. Wow, thank you. Nabati mo ako. Okay, so. But where does that money come from? Isn't it from the government's money? Isn't it from the taxes that we have given? And so, why do they do that? It's actually to promote themselves and to promote what, you know, I guess they have all their other agendas in the future. And that is why they need us to be reminded of who they are. But you know, as a people of God, the king that we serve is not like that. The king that we serve does not need his name to be placed on waiting sheds, name plastered on basketball courts, name, names in, his name engraved on walls because he is a humble servant. He is a humble, secure king of all kings. Now, if our king is like that, another application to that is, how about us as a church? Are we also willing to serve even if we don't get recognized? Are we also willing to serve others even if they don't reciprocate or they don't appreciate us? Are we willing to give our best at work even if our bosses would not you know, commend us for our jobs? Are we willing, if you're a government official, are you willing to invest your life and serve to the best of your ability even if you don't get the recognition that you do reserve, deserve. I like how uh, one statement, statesman put it. He said, Harry Truman said, it's amazing what you can accomplish if you do not care who gets the credit. I believe this world is about to see what God can do through a people who does not care who gets the credit. This world is about to see. Can you imagine if all of us here in church would start serving even if we don't get the credit? Can you imagine what happens to our homes when even though we don't get appreciated, we still serve and we still love? Can you imagine our offices? Can you imagine if our government officials one day will serve even if they don't get the credit? That's an amazing sight, isn't it? Something to look forward to something that our King Jesus is building, something that we can look forward in the future. In verse 3, it says, A bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. What is a bruised reed? What is a faintly burning wick? Some of us are just thinking of John Wick, but this is different. Okay, What is a bruised reed? Um, I grew up in the province and we have a lot of these. We have a lot of reed. Uh, it's uh, uh, tall grasses, um, talahib as we call it. And a bruised reed is um, a reed that does, I guess, because of the wind, nabali na siya, okay? And oftentimes in the province or especially in their time, whenever a reed is broken, the only logical thing to do is just to completely put it down so that you can trample upon it. A smoldering wick or a faintly burning wick is like a small candle who's about to go out and the fire is dimming and dimming until it's completely snuffed out. But here, 
Jesus, as the king who is just, is depicted as someone who will not break reeds and who will snuff out or quench dimly lit candles. In other words, this king who is just, he is also a merciful and compassionate king. You're familiar with the story um, that happened in John chapter 8. It is the story of this woman who was caught in adultery. And the religious leaders, what they did according to John chapter 8 was, um, as they caught this woman, they dragged this woman. Kinaladkad, okay? Dragged this woman from the house, dragged the woman, you know, into, into the streets and, you know, in the, in the square where everyone was there. And all these religious leaders were shouting and very angry, you know, with the sin of this woman. And so they threw the woman, you know, on, the, uh, on, on that square and Jesus was there in the picture. And um, the religious leaders thinking that this could be a way for them to test Jesus, how just he is and how um, morally upright he is. And so he, they asked Jesus, Jesus, this woman was caught in adultery. The law of Moses says we should stone her to death. Should we stone her now? And people were shouting, yeah, yeah, stone, stone, stone. And so what happened? Jesus, we know this from the Passion of the Christ movie. Jesus stooped down towards the ground and with his finger started to write. Some theologians and some Bible experts say Jesus was writing the Ten Commandments once again on the ground as if mirroring what happened in Exodus when God with his fingers wrote on the two tablets of stone the Ten Commandments. Jesus again was writing. And as he was writing, people were demanding, Jesus, what do we do? This woman was caught in the act. This woman is here and she is, you know, deserving of punishment. Should we stone her now? And the people were picking up those stones and they're getting ready. When Jesus gives a go, you know, they're ready to throw those stones. But Jesus stood up and said, Whoever among you here is not guilty of breaking any of the laws, let him be the first one to throw a stone. Whoever among you here is innocent. Please, be the first one to throw the stone. And then Jesus, as John chapter 8 said, again continued what he was doing. Wrote down the commandments. Thou shalt not take the Lord's name in vain. Honor the Sabbath. Honor your parents. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness towards your neighbors. As Jesus was writing, and as the people looked and realized their own guilt and shame, you would, you, and they heard those stones fall. Pa, 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 pa. One by one, they started to peel off from the crowd, went back to their homes until it was only the woman and Jesus Christ left in that scene. When Jesus looked up and saw that those who were accusing were gone, she asked the woman, Woman, where are those who were trying to stone you? Where are those who tried to condemn you? And the woman said, they're gone. No one is here now to condemn me. And this is what Jesus said. Then neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. Sometimes we make mistakes. Sometimes we commit sin. And in those times, we feel like we have broken our relationship with God. It's like we're that, that, that small candle. Our faith in God, our trust in God is about to be quenched. And we are about to throw in the towel. But Jesus is saying, neither do I condemn you. Go from now on. Sin no more. Now, of course, our sins, they have consequences. Of course, God is still just. But this just king is also a merciful king. And he's just waiting for his people to go to him, to come to him, and to experience his forgiveness. Experience this grace. Experience this mercy that will make us go and sin no more. There's something about encountering the grace of God. 
There's something about encountering the mercy of God because if it is genuine, it is what will cause you to go and sin no more. When you realize the penalty, when you realize the price that Jesus has paid, when you realize the love that he expanded and extended towards us on the cross 2,000 years ago, that same grace, that same love is what will motivate you to say no and go and sin no more. That's the kind of king that we have. He is a just king, and his justice is fueled with compassion. His justice is fueled by mercy. That is why we can go to him. That's Jesus. How about us as a church? If as a church we say that he is our king, how can we express that compassion towards others? See, I'm guilty of this. Oftentimes, especially when not here in church, oftentimes when I look at people, oftentimes thoughts of judgments will come in my mind. But as the king who neither condemns but instead extends mercy, as a church, we too are supposed to extend mercy. We too should extend that compassion. We too should expen- extend that mercy towards others. I'm hoping that in this church, when people who feels like that they are like a like reed that was broken or a wick that is about to be snuffed out, I hope that they will feel safe in this church. I hope that they will feel, you know, not judged, but welcomed. I hope that they will feel that, you know, there's a people here who cares for them. And there's a people here who is willing to be patient and help them in their journey with God. If there's a root of judgmentalism in us, I hope that we would allow God to root it out, to take that out, because it is not the character of our King. I pray that we would be more compassionate and merciful, just like our King. Verse 4, it says, He will not grow faint or be discouraged till He has established justice in the earth, and the coastlands wait for his law. In other words, yes, he brings order through his limitless power. He brings order in humility. He, brings, he sets things right with mercy, but he is also setting things right with tenacity. Next week, we'll be looking more into this. But suffice it to say that this Jesus, this king who is for justice, who is for setting things in order, he is committed. He will see things through. In fact, um, Paul said in Philippians, he said this, and I ask you, can we read this all together? One, two, three, go. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Paul was saying, I am sure. After encountering the risen Christ, He said to the Philippian believers, I am sure whatever God started in you, God will bring it into completion. Some of us, we see some things not in order in the way we relate with our spouse. Jesus is saying, I am confident in this. He will see the the work that he started in you completed in its Um, in how God designed it to be. Some of us, we're experiencing some disorder in our relationship with God or even disorder in the way we handle our finances. In all of those things, we can be confident in this, that Jesus is faithful to bring into completion the order that He is bringing in in those aspects of our lives. As we close today, I'd like the music team to uh, come up There's this story of uh, two kids who were playing uh, baseball. And as one kid threw the ball, the other one, you know, with his bat, you know, with all his strength, tried to strike the ball, and he did. But when he did, the ball hit a huge window of the neighbor, of a neighbor. And so this huge house with this big window, and they hit it it came crashing down. Basag. And so when that happened, the guy, you know, um, threw the bat and they, you know, ran towards a, a, a bush for cover and they were waiting who's going to look up, who's going to, 
look for us. Who's, gonna, who's the owner of that place? And they saw a man, you know, peeping through the window, looking through the window and said, he was looking, sino yung nakabasag nito? I mean, he was looking for who's the culprit. So they didn't see, he didn't see the two boys because they were covering. And after that, they ran, the boys ran. A week after, these two boys, they were walking in the uh, supermarket. And one of the kids, as he looked, he saw the guy that he saw looking, uh, uh, looking through the window. He saw the same guy in the supermarket. And when he saw the guy, he said to his friend, Takbo na tayo. <laughs> Let us run. Okay. And then when they looked at the guy, the guy looks at them, and he saw these two kids run. This guy also ran towards him because he realized these are the two kids, okay? He's responsible for breaking my window. And so the, he, they ran as fast as they could and he ran, you know, for them. He ran and tried to catch them. And so when they were stuck there at a dead end, they were there and waiting for the guy and the guy arrived. He said, it was not us. <laughs> Obviously, they were guilty. And so the owner of the house said, don't be afraid. I'm not here to punish you. I'm just here. Because I know you, the two of you broke my window, but I'm here also to tell you, I have fixed my window now. You can play again near my house. See, sometimes when we do things against God, we tr- run as far away as possible from Him. But this King whom Isaiah said is a just king. This king, yes, he paid the price because that man paid the price for his window. Jesus also paid the price for us so that we can be forgiven, so that we can be restored back to him. The Bible says, he did not abolish the law, but he came to fulfill the law. That he paid for our transgressions. That all the sins that we have committed, it was paid for by Christ on the cross 2,000 years ago. And that, my brothers and sisters, is the reason why we can receive this justice that He promises. This is the reason why we can hold on to Him and believe for justice. Because we know 2,000 years ago, He already paid for it. The price has been, been paid. And he said, one day, he will come back again so that we will see the fullness of his justice and order displayed. Can I ask everyone to please stand up? Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. Lord, we are grateful that we serve a God is just a God, Lord, who who is merciful as well. A God who has the power to set all things right. And so this morning, we look to you, Jesus, as the only source of true and lasting justice. As the one who cares for us, who is merciful and compassionate towards us. God, Lord, we come to you. Just allow the Holy Spirit to move and to speak at this time. I believe that He is ministering. I believe that He is speaking. For some of us here, I believe that God wants to set things in order in certain aspects of our lives. I see a picture of, you know, just like things starting to fall in its proper place. It's like God is just rearranging and just restructuring and just, you know, um, fixing the things that were once broken. Maybe it's with a relationship with somebody. Maybe it's, you know, um, with regards to how we treat our bodies. Maybe it's our body itself that needs the reordering of God. Whatever it is, I believe that the Holy Spirit, God is here. And He is now speaking order to where there is none. Holy Spirit, would you do that work right now? Holy Spirit, I pray for those of us who are believing for order in our bodies. Lord, we speak in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. 
Let there be order. Let there be order in our bodies, Lord. I pray that the systems of our bodies will function properly. Lord, we declare, Lord, that you would command, Lord, our cells, Lord, to align itself, Lord. Thank you that in you all things hold together. And Lord, we claim that, Lord, right now. In Jesus' name. Some of us here, we're believing for relational restoration. I pray even now, Lord, Holy Spirit, would you do that work, Lord? Thank you for the new patience. Thank you for the new grace. Thank you for the forgiveness that you're giving us today, Lord. And I pray that we would be able to experience relational reconciliation, restoration, Lord God, of once of things that are not in order right now. Thank you that you're going to give my brothers and sisters the wisdom. Lord, we receive this, Lord, by faith. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise God. Praise God. We're not yet done. We're going to worship God. How many of you believe God, this Jesus that we serve, he deserves our worship, amen? He deserves our praise. So let's sing this song to her. Let's appreciate this King of kings and Lord of lords that we have. Victorious King, Savior of all.
once again, we submit to you, O God, as the one who knows everything, who has the best in mind for each one of us, the one who's in control, the one who is sovereign in all things, the one who loves us, the one who is merciful, the one who is righteous, and the one who is just. God, Lord, today as we lift up our hands, Lord, we are saying we are submitting our lives once again to you, Jesus, as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. God, we pray, may you be the Lord of our homes. May you be the Lord of our workplaces. May you be the Lord of our studies, God. Lord, may you be the Lord of our mouths. May you be the Lord of our thoughts. May you be the Lord of our hearts, Lord. May you be the Lord of our relationships. May you be the Lord of our marriages. May you be the Lord of our homes, oh God. May you be the Lord of this nation. God, Jesus, we look to you as the King who will bring order, who will set things right, who will accomplish your purpose here on earth. And we submit to that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.